and we still have a lot to learn from it. That's why NASA scientists and experts all across the world are working to get more detailed views of the great beyond. We are excited to have Candace Jordan from the Shield Planetarium in Gastonia here with us in studio to explain what we are seeing. Candace, it is good to have you in person here yes, with us. Yes, it's good to be in person here <laughs> and to share all this really exciting stuff. I hope people have heard about it so far. <laughs> right, it's circulating uh, just about everywhere. What's most impressive to you? I know we're gonna walk through each of these photos, but what stands out uh, as a scientist to you? Oh, that's like a loaded question because <laughs> everything stands out. I would say like the, the Karina Nebula like that just looks like a gorgeous wallpaper I'm like I want a sticker of that mm -hmm. and I want to put it like on my car on my door like everywhere it's gorgeous right? yeah <laughs> I wanted to talk about the comparison of the Karina Nebula from the Hubble to the James Webb Space Telescope yes. because there's been some obviously improvements of resolution capacity and all this to give us the difference in these pictures what do we see different in the new updated photo that we didn't see for the first time yeah so a lot of these photos you're seeing on your screen right now it's just more more detail, more clarity. We're seeing a lot more of those galaxies, a lot more detail. So that image right there is Stefan's quintet, and you're actually seeing those galaxies merging together. Mm. And the Carina Nebula, you're you're seeing some of those uh, interactions where like gases are being blown out. You're seeing new stars being formed. Um, in the Southern Ring Nebula, we were able to see that that's actually a binary star. Um, scientists had thought that it might be, but now we have kind of confirmation that, hey, it is a binary star. So, um, you know, to the average layperson, we're seeing really cool images to scientists. There's so much they don't even know yet. They're mm -hmm. gonna study these images for a long time to come. It reminds me of when you go to the eye doctor there and they're like, what looks better, one or two? And you're like, oh my gosh, I can see I can so see much clearer right right now. <laughs> it's like you get that new pair of glasses and you put them on, you adjust for a second, you're like, whoa, this, this is, what is what, what I'm seeing? Like, mm -hmm. Kind of like ah. the difference between an X-ray and an MRI. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. see you so you much get, more. Yeah. yeah. It, and, and James Webb is looking in the infrared. So yeah. we're looking like at heat signatures in space. And um, it can actually cut through some of that gas and dust in space, those infrared wavelengths. So we're actually able to see things that were um, obscured by some other like visible yeah. telescopes and such. Well, I want to speak about the wavelengths here because something that we've seen in, I want to get this name right here, the WASP-96B. <laughs> we, we didn't even know that this stuff was out there. Now we're seeing that there could be water vapor on the yes. planet. Speak about that because we're, we're getting these things that we didn't even know was out there. Exactly. So WASP-96b is an exoplanet, so a planet outside of our solar system. Mm -hmm. And uh, what happens is we point the telescopes at the star, mm -hmm. and as that planet crosses in front of the star, uh, you can capture that light coming through the atmosphere, and then scientists can take a bunch of science stuff uh -huh. and, and see what's in there. So they actually saw traces of water vapor in the atmosphere of this planet. Now, uh, you know, can we connect the dots and say there's life? <laughs> like, no. Uh, first off, this planet is like well over a thousand degrees. Mm -hmm. It goes around its star once every three and a half days. So its year is three and a half days long. Wow. So it, it gets really around fast. real quick. <laughs> <laughs> it's like the NASCAR <laughs> planet's there. Yeah. Well, you mentioned the, the light changing around the planet and something I was looking at, it said gravitational lenses. Oh, what yes. exactly is that? Yeah, so the deep Field image, so the one that you see kind of all these like specks on there, all of those are galaxies. Mm -hmm. And um, if you see there in the middle, there is actually a little some of those galaxies look like they're really stretched out. Mm -hmm. um, there is a cluster of galaxies right there in the foreground, and it's so massive that it actually bends the fabric of space and time. Ooh. And so what happens <laughs> is it bends that light around. So you're seeing these like behind galaxies as they're bent around, and they kind of look like lines in the sky. So. Ooh. So cool. I know. I know. Grab another cup of coffee there. Gravitational lensing, not for the faint of heart. Uh, no, it's kind of in one ear and out the other. Right. But I still appreciate what we are looking at. I was reading an article with a, a NASA astrophysicist, and even she was saying, I, I can't even begin to comprehend what we are looking at, which just goes to tell you the scope and the magnitude of what we're getting back and, and what it could hold for the future. Exactly. And, you know, we the, the deep field image, we're looking over 13 billion light years away. Uh, to put that in perspective really quickly, like the New Horizons mission that went to Pluto took a decade to get there. If you could travel to the speed of light to Pluto, which is in our solar system, it would take you four and a half hours. So, you know, traveling 13 billion years 
Mm. At the speed hey, of light. It's hard it's, to wrap your head it around. It is. It's so hard to wrap your head around that. Um, and, you know, it only took James Webb about five days to get all of these images. So, you know, we're going to be cranking out new images, I would foresee very regularly. So, mm. you know, if you need a daily <laughs> dose of something new, like, James Webb will have you covered here. Oh, man. <laughs> Where do we go from here, though? So now that we have the images, what's next? Because this is just the beginning, as you mentioned. Yes. What do we do from here? Yeah, so there are lots of uh, research projects that scientists really want to look at. So, for example, like exoplanets. So just like WASP-96b um, and looking at other nebulas and different galaxy mergers. So uh, there are lots of, lots of projects lined up for this. We will also be able to see some things in our solar system, too, with this. Mm. So um, we're projecting that this mission should last about 20 years it could be more just like Hubble so we've got a lot of stuff to come over the next couple of decades. Well, and it's pretty cool. You all had an event in conjunction with NASA's launch mm -hmm. of a release of the pictures, and you all had 700 or so young minds walk through the museum. What does that do to inspire the next generation of researchers who may very well be working on some of these projects? Yeah, it's so nice. I had uh, one of the summer camp kids yesterday. Um, they were talking about, NASA was talking about how they color some of these images because it's an infrared light. We don't see infrared light with our own eyeballs. So they color these images to kind of pick out more detail. And she was like, how do I become a, an image colorer for NASA? Like, <laughs> yeah. I want to do that. And like, you know, it just sparks that curiosity. And also that, you know, you don't have to be an astronaut to work for NASA. You can do so well, and much. In fact, if, if this experiment and, and this telescope has taught us anything, it takes years and and thousands of people mm -hmm. to get it up there it does so engineers scientists mathematicians you know anything like that meteorologists <laughs> yes i mean we needed meteorologists because we delayed the launch a couple of times just for weather mm -hmm. so you have to have a meteorologist and then there's also this thing called space weather so you know if you like space and weather hello space weather we can you. hardly handle it down here <laughs> exactly. i might be in the wrong profession guys <laughs> I think one of the most remarkable things, too, is looking at this is, is how the chances were so slim of this actually working at some mm. point. We really didn't know if we were going to be able to pull this off. There were times where it may not have worked. Yeah. And the fact that it pulled off and now we're getting the images, I mean, there was some significant worry in the scientific community. Is this thing going to even work? Right. I mean, this has been a decade in the making. And, you know, last year we all got hyped up. It was like, okay, it's going to launch on this day. Oh, it's delayed. It's going to launch. Oh, mm. it's delayed. And we're all like, is it going to launch? <laughs> and it finally did. And then, you know, we had the, the micrometeors hit the mirrors, and so they were worried about those. And yeah. it's like, is this going to interrupt our scientific data? Because if one thing goes wrong, right. it snowballs. It's un like, unlike Hubble that's only a couple of miles or a couple hundred miles away from Earth. We can go and fix it. You know, yeah. it's a process, but we can go and fix it. We can't go a million miles away. <laughs> Humans have never done that yet. So, you know, if something breaks... Ah! <laughs> we started off with almost like a transformer type thing that yes. had to unfold and as it continues to get these images we we're just kind of at the whim of really the the hardware right i mean luckily we do have positioned it in a place it's not an asteroid belt you know mm -hmm. it's tagging along with earth a million miles away so you know it's in a relatively safe spot you yeah. know so good things to come for sure no reboots coming up in the no future. Reboots, hopefully, no reboots, <laughs> hopefully Certainly yeah. exciting. Uh, what are you most looking forward to uh, in terms of just the science and the data that, that will come from this? Yeah, I, I'm really excited to just be able to share all this at the planetarium mm -hmm. because, you know, if we get these new images coming pretty regularly, you know, we run shows daily at the show museum so we can show those things kind of in real time and just have these really cool new images that are, coming regularly. You know, everybody loves to come and see a really cool nebula in the planetarium when it's way over your head and you feel like you're in space. It's the most incredible thing. It's kind of what we've all thought it might be like, but you don't really have that picture until yeah. now. Yeah, exactly. Know? What about the the scope of how big these things are that we're looking? Because we, like you mentioned, hey, the desktop, we could put it on the back. Looks Great. kind of small, but one of my, the reasons I started studying weather was because of how insignificant it made me feel. Like it showed the the breadth of what weather could do here on Earth. But when you talk about things 
billions of light years away, even the scope of what we're seeing is huge. Yeah, so if you imagine going to the beach, you guys are probably heading to the beach this summer. I want you to pick up a grain of sand, all right, just one grain of sand off the beach, and I want you to hold it at arm's length. That is the size of this image you see on your TV. That's how much sky it took up. Uh, mm. So imagine just how many grains of sand we would need at arm's length to cover up an entire sky. There are just billions and trillions of galaxies out there and we just haven't photographed them yet. I mean, we're, you know, it's like trying to find a, a teeny tiny needle or a grain of sand in a haystack. Well, and now you've got a lot of scientists taking each of these images and just going frame by frame and just really yes. combing through. I mean, I'm sure people haven't slept the last two nights, you know, just <laughs> right to, to look at everything. Yeah, I, I'm, I've been kind of saying that this is now like a scientist playground. Mm -hmm. Like, they are going through, and it's like, oh, let me get on the slide, and oh, let me get on this. Like, it's just, like, it's like a child on a playground. Like, you just don't know what to start with yeah. first. And scientists are just incredibly excited to go and pick through and see what new discoveries they can find. Well, gosh, Candace, we really appreciate you coming in with us yeah. and kind of walking us through mm -hmm. each of these photos. Yeah, and guys, come on out to the Shill Museum. We're open seven days a week. Shillmuseum.org is a great place to go to. There awesome. you go. It makes me feel like a little kid again, just looking <laughs> at space. It's like Christmas. I love it. Exactly.